Good afternoon. Um, my name is Julia Mascagni. I'm co-research director uh, at the ICTD. So uh, it's a great honor to host you at this conference as ICTD, but also to be hosted by uh, our wonderful host from KESRA and the KRA. So thank you very much for the warm welcome. Um, this is the ICTD lecture. Uh, it's going to work slightly different uh, than the other panels. Uh, we will have the lecture itself for about 25 minutes at the beginning. Uh, we then have three very distinguished uh, discussants, which I will introduce uh, just before they speak. Um, and we will then have plenty of time for questions and discussion and interaction. Uh, keep in mind for that discussion that the session is live streamed, so no Chatham House rules. Uh, still, I hope we can have uh, an open uh, and engaged discussion. So the lecture today is about what has Africa learned from a decade uh, in multinational negotiations? And I couldn't think of a better person to deliver the lecture uh, than Mary Baine from uh, ATAF, the African Tax Administration Forum. Uh, she's the Deputy Executive Secretary at ATAF and also the Head of Member Services and Domestic Resource Mobilization. She has also been leading uh, ATAF's efforts in those negotiations and we have heard already several times in the various discussions we had so far about the importance of ATAF's role to foster that collective voice um, and to really uh, show how regional organizations can contribute to the success of um, uh, lower income countries' participation in those negotiations. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Mary to the podium. Thank you, Julia, for your kind introduction. And uh, I want to start by also thanking the ICTD and KESRA for the kind invitation and for hosting us to such an interesting discussion. I think it's been a very, very interesting two days and Will and Tim, we are really, really grateful for this kind invitation. And we hope that um, the lessons learned here, the relationships, the networks, will you know, take us a lot further in this journey that we have all undertaken. I also want to say that um, it was really nice seeing everybody after quite a long time. Uh, I've met most of you virtually, and I must say, in some instances, when we met, I was like, oh, are they this tall? Or, oh, are they this short? But it was really nice to you know, put the different names to the faces, and to discuss these very, very um, complex issues, but with a very, very human face. So for purposes of this uh, discussion this afternoon, I will say that the way I understand this assignment is that it is an opportunity to share Africa's experience. It's not about the technicalities of the negotiations, but to talk about those pain points, to talk about the lessons learned, and to talk about what we see as the future. And so, um, without wasting much time, I want to say that for Africa, it has been a bit of a roller coaster. It has been engaging. It has been difficult at times. And at times, um, I think the African members, if they were to tell the truth, they felt like walking away. And at some point, I will actually get to that. We felt like that. But in the end, and um, as we went along, there were also very many lessons that where everybody feels we couldn't have done without. So of course, taxation goes back a very, very long way. And uh, we know that, um, I think, I can't remember who was speaking earlier and making reference to the League of Nations, where the UN model tax convention was being managed at the League of Nations as uh, early in the 1950s. And so, in relation to the discussions of the last two days, the international community has been working to develop this set of international tax rules to address a common problem, both for the developed and the developing world, because we realized that indeed there was a loss of a significant share of uh, what could have been taxed for development. And because of this, as I said, both the developed and the developing went into these discussions. And Africa was not left behind. I also want to say that uh, these issues 
were initiated indeed by the, uh, by the OECD G20, and um, they largely looked at the BEPS uh, issues. And ATAF and Africa were really involved um, from around 2015. And as I said, and like previous speakers have said, Martin, I did read your, your article. And I found it very interesting when you said that, you know, initially these countries came in as um, a way of making the whole process inclusive and making sure, giving it a, a, you know, a global face. But guess what? We are now here on the table and we're here to stay. So everybody will have to deal with us with and, you know, all the problems that we come with, but also with all the opportunities that we see. And from here, I want to borrow from what Marlene said yesterday regarding the complexity of some of these issues and the fact that while we are struggling, it is also a learning curve that we must learn and we must exploit. So for now, international tax happens really in two places, the OECD and the UN. And for, I'll start with the OECD and say that what we need to understand, and I don't know how, how to say this in a kinder way, but what Africa has learned and what Africa needs to understand is that indeed, we have been invited to a platform that's not ours. We are invited to the platform that is not ours. And because of that, we must play by the rules of that platform. And that's why we have struggled. So if this is to be addressed, what do we need to do? And I say this is evidenced by the lackluster response to some of the concerns that we had, oh, about the pace, about the complexity of the negotiations. But what we need to understand is that the people that we are playing with or the platform at which we are has countries, or rather has, um, has expertise that doesn't struggle. It is very easy for these countries to come into a room um, a dozen at a time and handle the different issues, whereas there is one person from one African nation also handling the same issues. So it was just not uh, bound to be easy. And that is what we have struggled with, and that is what Africa has to understand, that at the end of the day, we are playing on a platform that is not ours, and therefore, we need to understand the rules, and therefore, develop our own platform, develop our own way of doing things, and then go with a common position so that we can be heard. And here, I want to say, I want to qualify one thing. I want to separate the members of the OECD from the Secretariat, because truth be told, the Secretariat did try. They did try to involve the countries, but the countries, we need to look at the countries. They have interests, they have plans, they have people, they have, they've come with an agenda. They don't want to lose any more revenue. So if we are struggling, we better sort ourselves out. And that is what has been really uh, happening. So the question begs, why did African countries and other developing countries engage in the process? And do the issues that are being handled there still matter for Africa? In my and Atap's view, many of the issues the best project was trying to address still matter to Africa because we all continue to experience base erosion, including through artificial uh, profit shifting. Secondly, despite Africa having attracted significant MEs in a broad range of sectors, such as in extractives, agriculture, telecommunication, etc., according to the African Tax Outlook, which is a publication of ATAF, an annual publication. The tax to GDP ratio for Africa remains at about 17% compared with the rest of the world. Additionally, while corporate income tax remains critical for African countries, data shows that the collection is still lower than our counterparts from the OECD. So I'm detailing this as evidence that Africa needs and, um, and still requires to enhance its capacity to increase the corporate tax yield from these MNEs and indeed uh, try to expand its base. And so, for these rights, we will continue to soldier on and fight. So, to address cross border shifting, a range of national laws, including tax laws in combination with international cooperation and exchange of information mechanisms, is required. So, with this, um, I want to go to the next part. Uh, of my uh, discussion and talk about 
the benefits for African countries or the lack thereof. That said, Aitaf agrees with commentators who spoke before me that not all action, uh, not all action plans under BEPS had immediate relevance to countries. And that is why we were selective in terms of what we dealt with. We realized we couldn't deal with everything. Most of it didn't matter. And it brings to mind um, an example that I want to share. When I was working for the Rwanda Revenue Authority, and it's a pleasure to see Hajira here, there is a time I, I threw a tantrum. There was a mentorship program where people from the West were mentoring people from Africa. And there was um, a gentleman, Dave Hartnett, who was the head of HMRC, and he was mentoring me. So we went to meetings and everybody was talking about uh, transfer pricing and all. And I was like, all right, I mean, kind of a fix because I don't have that. So I went and I threw a tantrum and I told Dev Hartnett, if you do not give me somebody to help me with transfer pricing, then we are calling this off. So Dave gave me somebody. And that somebody came and asked me, how many MNEs do you have in your country? And I was like, okay, there's this, there's this, there's this. And I stopped and he was, um, then maybe this is not what you need. But it took somebody to come from there to tell me that my risks were elsewhere. And this is what we learned, and this is what we exploited. So we went for those actions that we thought were really important for Africa. And I'll give a few examples. We went for action four, which is the limitation of interest deduction. Action seven, artificial avoidance of permanent establishment status. Action eight to 10 on transfer pricing. Action 13 on um, um, country by country reporting. And that is how uh, Africa and ATAP has tried to navigate these other complex uh, issues. Like we know, it hasn't been an easy journey. And so not everything was achieved. And so when we went to the next level, which is now the ongoing uh, two pillar discussion, the concerns or the challenges that I spoke about earlier did not stop. So where does Africa stand? Has there been any improvement? Are we gaining? So starting with pillar one, particularly the amount air rules, uh, which aim to do two things, create a new taxing right and reallocate uh, profits to market jurisdictions. Here we feel the, 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 the right is in place. Are the gains going to be what we expected? The answer is no. Do we leave the process? The answer is definitely not. Because once you're there, you, you fight, and you continue talking, and for as long as you continue talking, then you continue hoping that this will change. So besides, besides that, there's also the work on amount B, which we felt was, is very good for Africa and which we have been fighting for, and the designs, while still being discussed, we continue to fight for that because we identified that as an area that was going to be supportive to our processes. Under pillar two, um, the global minimum taxation of profits in scope multinational enterprises could um, reduce the race to the bottom. And while we don't agree with, uh, with the 15%, and we say this earlier and we continue to say this because it's way, way too little compared to the, you know, um, the taxation levels in Africa, we actually continue to argue for 25 to 35%, but uh, 15 has been uh, agreed upon. And so for us, we feel that we need to look at some of the areas where we can, um, we can leverage some wins for Africa. And through this, we have been able to continue um, advocating for countries to reduce their tax incentives, and so have come up with measures that we hope countries, uh, if adopted, can help countries. And that is why um, we continue to, we developed the suggested approach on domestic minimum top-up tax. I know uh, earlier today when we were having lunch, we didn't, we, we did have a discussion that says this may have its challenges and we continue to do that. But what I want to say here is that these discussions have uh, been ongoing and will continue to go on. Everybody talked about the STTR. We feel that it is really, really important for Africa and will continue there. So those are some of the areas. So what has been achieved and uh, through what process? So what is clear for me is not those technicalities. What is clear for me is Africa's visibility. And that has been achieved. And that can't be taken away. And that is what Africa needs to exploit at the next level. Secondly, Africa's clearly assertive now in regards to what it wants. 
And I think that is something that also has been gained through this. And the demonstration to fight and defend our own taxing rights and positions. An example is in 2021, when we as Africa, having realized that what was on the table might not be yield much, put up a, a proposal that came to be known as the ATAF proposal. Was everything in there achieved? No. Was half of it achieved? No. But some of it was achieved. And if we feel that if we hadn't been on the table, that wouldn't have happened. Previous speakers have also talked about um, the issue of inclusivity, and I've, I also alluded to that earlier. And for us, we feel that that inclusivity is yet to be realized because, as again, as uh, even Marlene said yesterday and the others, the issue of complexity, the issue of the pace, and as I said, we are playing in a league that's not ours. And so we need to understand that we need to learn the rules of the game and then move on. So I'm saying that being in the room is critical. And that's why Nigeria and others could even come up with a position at the UN because they've sat in the room and realized that we weren't getting much. And specifically uh, under Pillar 1, we tried to fight for the extractive sector for very, very obvious reasons. We tried to fight for tax certainty, especially uh, against uh, mandatory binding arbitration. And we, although now there is an, a complicated elective process, we still feel that it was a gain. So noting that um, all these things, uh, some of these things are still at the table, it is critical to say that what has been a game changer is that there were people to be at, at the right time, they were there and they articulated uh, the pain points and they articulated the challenges. In terms of Pillar 2, uh, again, I talked about the gains and I talked about the areas where we are concentrating our efforts. And I hope that as countries, uh, we can continue to work together as African countries to try and always come up with positions so that these positions can then go and inform national uh, national decisions, because at the end of the day, it is the country. And here I want to take time and explain, because there have been uh, questions to us about ATAF's role. So ATAF's role is supportive. It supports the process, the African countries, those who have signed up, those who haven't signed up, those who intend to sign up, anybody, whatever decision they take, we provide the technical support. So what are the existing challenges and how are these addressed? So at any one time, we made sure that the members understood what the issues were at stake, and we feel that Africa is at a level now where they're able to come together, and through technical notes, through consultations, through meetings, through alliances. And here I want to say that we spent quite a number of nights discussing, trying to agree on a time with Marlene and the others to see when we could sit and discuss issues. But we didn't only stop at the developing countries, we even stopped, uh, talked to developed countries. And actually, this has, um, has really, really been helpful. So all this was really hard work, and, and uh, it required putting in man, man hours. Of course, COVID-19 came in as a bit of a blessing because most of the work was done virtually. But what I want to say here is it is a process that is complicated, especially for developing countries, because the, it is simply so much work. I recall in October of 2022, when Pillar 2 was coming to, you know, uh, sort of a close, and um, there were meetings that went on for a month, nonstop. What that meant is that the, tech, the, the, the technical teams that were handling the discussions were not providing technical assistance to countries. But we had to do those man hours because we needed to be, you know, to have, um, to have discussions and uh, to make sure that we are the discussions and we are supporting the 27 members of the, uh, of the inclusive framework from Africa as well as supporting the members, the five members who are in the steering, in the steering group. And earlier on, I heard somebody say, I, I will talk about the task force on uh, taxing the digital economy. So all that required our presence there. So Africa has consistently um, learned that the intensity and frequency of these meetings, while really, really taking away lots of man hours, is important to them and that if for as long as they are in the discussions, then there's hope for achieving uh, some of these rights. So as you know, African countries have very limited resources in international tax units, and, uh, but however, 
these were developed through some form of division of labor uh, with ATAF, and we did manage to spread across and engage in everything. So while even our resources were stretched, as I said, we agreed on a division of labor and we were able to move here because we realized that uh, the importance of our presence. Again, there was limited political guidance. And this has been really, really uh, a pain point because here we were in a discussion with people who have full support um, from their countries. And AITAF and the other members engaged the African Union Commission and the subcommittee on tax and illicit financial flows has been put in place. I'm happy to say that it, it has met twice and hopefully going forward, it is going to lead uh, in, this, in these processes and ensure that um, whatever direction is required will be provided. So despite all these challenges, as I said, we, uh, Africa continued to soldier on and the technical discussions have largely been at the cross-border taxation technical committee that is again organized by AITAF. But again, I talked about the fact that we are in all the working party meetings where the decisions are taken and we try to make sure that we provide notes, that we provide guiding notes, that we provide suggesting, suggested approaches, and all this to make sure that the countries are well um, resourced and they're okay. Julia, how am I doing for time? Okay, thank you. So in terms of the lessons learned, and I'm about to conclude, one is that there's need for inclusivity and participation. That has to happen. Otherwise, uh, there's a famous saying that uh, is attributed to Matthew, who was in the, in the discussion earlier, Matthew Bonjivola from Nigeria, that if you're not uh, on the table, then you will be sadly on the menu. So the issue of inclusivity and participation then begs that um, you know, countries must realize that they must participate to be able to articulate what they feel is good for them. Africa has also learned the issue of prioritization and strategic focus. I talked about this, I will not belabor the point. Multilateral cooperation, I talked about the need to engage other areas. And it's through these negotiations that countries have now learned the need for exchange of information and how they need to have mutual assistance to be able to get information that they lack. I talked about the need for presence, I talked about the need for capacity, and I think even as we go into um, the next phases, it will be critical for us uh, to build that capacity. And of course, the issue of uh, power imbalance. This, there's really, really this need for political support, I talked about it, and because of the, uh, the current arrangement that we have with the African Union, we hope that that will be addressed. Continental engagement, I talked about the, um, the need to understand um, where really our interests lie is what has really now uh, preoccupied us as a continent and we continue uh, you know, to identify the areas where we feel Africa will be able to gain. So as I, um, I want to say, to talk slightly about the UN, and I want to say that uh, both uh, the African Union Commission and ATAF have given our comments to the SG regarding the UN process. We are excited about it because we hope that what couldn't have been achieved uh, in the other areas should be achieved here. We have learned the, game, the rules of the game and we hope that um, we should be able uh, you know, to, to pull it through. So what am I saying? I'm saying that Africa needs to do four critical things. One, create its own platform and we can build on the use of the existing UN subcommittee too enhance our knowledge on the technical issues. And we've created friends and we've created partnerships. I can see uh, Irma from the University of Leiden that we have been partnering with. And of course the ICTD that is always churning up lots of research that we can use. So we need to do that. Three, there must be our decisions, our positions must be supported by data analysis and research. They must be evidence-based and that is what we missed in the beginning. Because the pace was so fast, by the time we went through with the research, the decisions had been taken for heaven's sake. So that must drive the processes as we go along. And fourth, we must develop common positions that will in turn be, um, be uh, taken up 
uh, that will help individual jurisdictions. Sorry, I was looking at the time and I lost my thought. Individual jurisdictions. And Africa has fought a good fight for equitable rights. It hasn't been won, and this is yet to be achieved. Its success in the future will be determined on how it positions itself, both politically and technically, as well as how it responds to the lessons learned, and when eventually attained, the rights we have fought for and earned will be through excellence, will be through hard work, and will be through building our own capacity and our technical excellence. So New York, here we come. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. That was fascinating. Don't sit down yet. I'm going to ask you and uh, uh, the three discussants to please uh, join me uh, here on stage. Um, please, ladies, we have a, an all-women panel today, uh, which I'm very excited about. I'm going to introduce you to them in a second. Does this work? Yes, good. Um, yes. Great, welcome. Uh, thanks a lot for taking part. It's, uh, it's such a great uh, width and depth of expertise here, so I'm not going to take uh, any time away from you. I'm going to start uh, with um, Annette uh, Ogutu, who is a um, professor of tax law at the University of Pretoria. She was also a, a member of the FACTI panel and the Davis Tax Committee. Um, I will introduce our speakers uh, just before they speak. So Annette, uh, over to you for your remarks. You have about eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you, ICTD, I should say first, for the invitation. And thank you so much, uh, Mary, for your discussion or your lecture. It set a good platform from which we can begin the discussions about what Africa has learned. Now, to understand why African countries have learned some lessons and whether or not they have not learned others, it's important to understand the political economy and the context of Africa over the last few years that uh, underpins the development so far. We've already referred to the fact that multilateral organizations have a long history over a century ago that developed in the global north, basically because of the geopolitical and socioeconomic factors that drove the industrial revolution, the world wars that led to the rise of multinationals and the need for countries to raise taxes in order to rebuild after the wars. And then there was the need to prevent double taxation that drove the initial multilateral negotiations that were driven by the League of Nations, the UN, and the OECD. We've heard all that. While all this was happening, Africa was bedeviled by the ills of colonization. In effect, it was the object of the resources that we are needed for the Industrial Revolution, which was the benchmark from which uh, the multilateral uh, laws were developed. Post-colonial era in Africa, that is in the 1960s, saw an inheritance of colonial laws that we are basically in favor of the colonial countries, and double tax treaties that we have in favor of those colonial countries also. And then we had fiscal policies that were influenced by external actors such as the IMF, and we have issues with respect to heavy reliance on foreign aid and the heavy debt burden. So Africa largely focused by then on domestic tax laws rather than international tax laws. So essentially, gradually countries began to revise their tax laws so that they suit their economic realities. And so many states began signing treaties, but mainly these were political statements to get them involved in the international discourse. And they were reflecting the, the strong... Uh, uh, advantages of their treaty partners, which, may, which were mainly countries from the West. So we saw an Africa that was a passive adopter of what was already in place, and it was not questioning what is going on. What changed? As from the 1990s, we see an increase of multinationals that were investing in Africa, and the realization that foreign aid is not enough to enable sustainable development in Africa. So the 
2000s saw talks, increasing talks in Africa about domestic revenue mobilization, the impact of illicit financial flows, and so we see the Tabo Mbeki High Level Panel Report on Illicit Financial report, uh, 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 Flows on Africa that was issued in 2015, and we see um, 2015 the Financing for Development uh, Conference in Addis Ababa, where African countries were at the, the helm of calling for a UN global body, which was obviously pulled down. But those were the beginning times of Africa beginning to show its face on the international face. Around that time also uh, comes the OECD BEPS uh, action measures and um, the UN calls on, um, on, 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 uh, on developing countries to come up with views on what they think their BEPS concerns are and we see African countries stating what their concerns are. But at that level there wasn't much engagement. The only African country that is part of the G20 is South Africa. By then it was an OECD observer country but even being part of the OECD did not give South Africa clout to be able to change anything. But then it was part of it, and then we see an increase in the voice of Africa. It is, was concerted, failed, persistent, assertive, progressive, a voice that can be heard, a voice that can be that cannot uh, be ignored, as Mary has said. So what has Africa learned? African countries, we need to acknowledge, are not homogeneous. They have different economic uh, developments, different capaci administrative capacity. So the lessons they are, have learned differ from country to country. I'll talk about the country that I am resident in, and that is South Africa. South Africa has learned, and many other African countries at large, that time has come for us not to be reactionary, for us not to be passive, to take responsibility and take the bull by the horn, so to speak. We need to understand the context within which each is African country is, uh, is, is transacting and uh, develop tax policies based on our socioeconomic context, policies that consider exactly what we are going on and develop that. South Africa has had a history of actually reviewing tax policies. We have had numerous commissions of inquiry into South Africa's tax system. I had the opportunity to be part of the Davis Tax Committee and chaired the BEPS Tax Committee where we literally reviewed the whole of South Africa's tax system and we engaged with all stakeholders of government. And so the whole government approach is an important factor to consider. The silo approach is killing Africa where each department is literally protecting its staff. That is ain't going to work. If we are going to act on a multilateral level, we need to clean our business even at domestic level. We need to engage with politicians. I'm pleased to hear that ATAF is having strong engagements with the AU, and they have an AU office there. All right, engagement with investment agencies, we've talked about that, ministries of foreign affairs, civil society, this is very big. If we are going to get inroads, if we are going to influence um, the political, politically exposed people and the politicians to create change, civil society is going to play a big role. We have seen the role they've played in Kenya with respect to double tax treaties. Capacity is always going to be a big problem, but it should not be relied upon as a crutch for not attending to issues. We should seize the window periods that have been created at the international forums in order to attend to issues. Netherlands changed its policy with respect to double tax treaties in developing countries, and many African countries, including uh, Malawi, were able to get uh, to re, uh, renegotiate their treaties. There are lots of treaties that are being renegotiated by Mauritius, but there are African countries that are still silenced. It's always the usual suspects even in this forum we have here, the Ugandas, the Nigerias, the South Africans, and Ghanas of the day, where are the rest of the 54 African countries? Old laws need to be repealed. Some law-lying fruit needs to be taken captive, and we need to amend the laws. Let's change our policies, including our treaty policies. Engage economists to do impact assessments for us with respect to Pillar 2, with respect to tax incentives. We can't always sit down and wait for the waste to do things for us. That is a big wake-up call. The era of waiting for the waste to do things for us has got to come to an end. 
unrealistic expectations on the OECD and its allegiance to us has got to come to the end. And I think that is something that, um, that Mary has emphasized. And so, and she ended with the issue, at whose table actually are we? We need to create our own table, like you said, and have this kind of discourse that will bring the development of Africa higher. So those are some of my comments. Thank you. You put everyone else in the difficult position of having to come after that, and already Mary <laughs> had put us in a difficult position. Luckily, I don't have to speak much, so I'm going to pass it over to you, Chennai. Uh, Chennai uh, Mukumba is the acting executive director of Tax Justice Africa, uh, one of the key players uh, in civil society. Uh, so please, over to you. You also have about eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, wow. <laughs> I think that's, that's quite a lot to come after. Um, but I think it suffice to say that I completely agree with what both Mary and Annette have spoken to. And I think my reflections really just build off of what, what they were saying. So Annette concluded her remarks by saying that the era of waiting has got to come to an end. I would actually argue that the era of waiting for the African continent has already come to an end. And I think you see this by the different moves that are happening both in New York and I want to say even in Addis, um, in large part due to contributions from institutions such as ATAC where we are starting to see an increase in the political will we need for African countries um, in order to start to make an impact in global tax conversations. So I think for me, when I was thinking about this question, when I was thinking about what are what has been the lesson for Africa over the past 10 years? In, in trying to understand the different ways African countries have been engaging in multilateral tax negotiations, I think for me, one would say that you could consider that if you look at the way African countries have been participating in different conversations, you can almost draw two parallel strands of engagement. So the first drawing from what Annette said was the way in which African countries over the past 10 years engaged in existing conversations. So Mary and Annette gave us a picture of how currently, when you take a look at global tax conversations, they are being dominated by the OECD. And so whilst historically African countries had been at the periphery, in the 2000s you started to see an increased engagement um, of African countries in, this, in these conversations, particularly in 2013 when we, started to, when we saw the advent of the BIPs project. In terms of how successful African countries were and, and the way in which they were able to reap benefits from participating in that space, I think we've had various conversations that have spoken to different African countries' experiences. So yesterday morning, I think, was a fantastic panel where we heard the different perspectives of, of different country representatives. And I think even Mary has spoken to their experience um, as ATF in supporting African countries, particularly in recent conversations around the OECD. But I think if one was to summarize the way in which African countries have been able to reap benefits from that particular process, I think one would argue that it has not provided as substantive benefits as African countries would have wanted to. But African countries have recognized that it's important for them to be at the table, in essence to ensure that at the very least they're able to influence, even if it's a little bit, the conversations that come from that particular space. And so we saw increased participation within the existing mechanism. Um, within an existing mechanism where firstly African countries did not contribute to the development of those standards, um, but also secondly, after joining, found themselves often without sufficient resources, right? Technically, uh, from a human resource perspective, and even from a time and financial to, meaningly, to meaningfully participate in those conversations. And so part of those capacity issues, as part, as well, uh, part of the capacity issues as well as the rule issues, meant that in as much as African countries were there and participating, those conversations didn't provide them with as much reform of the global tech system as they have wanted. 
Now, I talk about African countries' participation in existing spaces um, that are being spearheaded by the OECD, but I think it's also important to mention that the BEPS project really came to be in 2013, but on the African continent, in 2012, we saw tax conversations that influenced global, global, global discussions also coming to the fore. So in 2012, the AU and UNECA commissioned the high-level panel, right, that essentially then saw the publication of the high-level panel report. Now, this is considered, you know, a seminal report on the African continent. In fact, the African continent is the only one, the only region that has this type of report. But one of the findings that was written within this report, finding number 15, was specifically a finding that said, illicit financial flows issues should be incorporated and better coordinated across United Nations processes and frameworks. This was as early as 2012, right? At the same time as we're seeing the advent of the BEPS process, speaking to the fact that yes, African countries are participating here, but they're also recognizing that this cannot last for long and it's important that we start to democratize and center conversations around the global tax system at the United Nations. So the high-level panel report was published, and we started to see several activities and events that drew from that. So we saw the establishment of a consortium to stem illicit financial flows on the continent. Um, we also saw, Annette mentioned this, you know, that 2015 Addis Ababa action agenda where, the, where African countries were really at the helm. Um, we also saw conversations about the adoption of a common African position on asset recovery in 2020. All of this speaking to activities that are taking place on the continent that are seeking to influence global discussions. Now, more recently, what we've actually started to see is increased momentum that's happened over the past couple of years, culminating in now this conversation that's happening at the United Nations. In 2020, and I actually want to say, largely in part by discussions that were happening at the OECD that weren't favorable to African countries, there was an extraordinary specialized technical committee on finance, monetary affairs, economic planning, and integration. It's a bit of a mouthful. But this extraordinary committee met to discuss the conversations that were happening at the OECD. And there was a briefing that was put out. And I want to read it because the language in that briefing for me was quite strong and I think reflective of how African countries are feeling now about the way in which global conversations are happening. So specifically it said, Developed countries are not listening to the concerns of developing countries and have no intention of redressing the balance of taxing rights in any significant way. Africa must mobilize itself at a political level if it is to change the stance of developed countries and address these key tax issues. This was two years ago in an AUC briefing document. And since then, there's really been this rapid movement, right? So this extraordinary um, STC resulted in the subcommittee that um, Mary was just talking about now, right? That met in Lusaka, I think it was last year, and then also then met last, last week, actually, where they were having conversations about what's happening in New York, what does the two-pillar process mean for African countries? Um, over and above that, we've started to see the African Union Commission develop two strategies. There's a tax strategy now, there's an IFF strategy now, right? Really speaking to the way in which African countries are understanding what's happening in the global system and really raising the bar in terms of recognizing that they need to start to engage much more meaningfully in these conversations. So I think for me, this question about what, have, what has Africa learned over the past 10 years, it's two things. The first, you have to participate in existing spaces, right? Because at the end of the day, they will influence you. But secondly, you also need to see the extent to which you can start to influence conversations in a way that is most meaningful for you. And this is what we're starting to see now culminating in this UN resolution that has potentially um, the, the possibility of an intergovernmental body where we will see inclusiveness and effectiveness in the way conversations happen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chennai. That was wonderful. Uh, the third discussant is <laughs> Nana Mensa. Um, so she was previously at the um, Ghana Revenue Authority, is now an independent consultant, uh, and it is a member of the UN Tax Committee. Uh, so over to you for your remarks. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think we can close now. I don't have <laughs> anything to add that has not been said by the other discussants. Um, I guess that my contribution will probably to speak a little bit more from the country perspective of what the lessons or what the journey over the past few, the past decade has been as a jurisdiction in the multilateral um, conversations or agreements. Now, um, coming from a tax authority and coming from the International Taxation Department within the tax authority, you've seen, I've seen the evolution of these multilateral conversations um, and the impact in my jurisdiction. And one of the key takeaways from Annette's contribution was the fact that um, Africa is not homogeneous. We are not one country, we are not one person, we are very diverse. A lot of the time it gets lost in translation because as diverse as we are, we are also very, very similar in a lot of our experiences and a lot of our cultural views and our societal norms. But at the root of the matter, we are very diverse. Um, and, and even in our diversity, even within our geographical or jurisdictional boundaries, there's a lot of diversity in the different jurisdictions. And, and it has played a big role in the journey for the multilateral conversation because you are, f you are trying to um, unite as a country and then you have to look at uniting as a region and, and, and approaching um, 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 the conversation as a united group. And I find that a lot of the time during the whole multilateral journey, Africa was treated as one block with one voice and or one viewpoint, which did not reflect what our situations were. So even when it comes to capacity, we mentioned that in this conversation, you find a lot of African jurisdictions that keep coming up over and over again, and others are very silent. But that also comes down to the fact that we are not the same. And the capacities that came, we came to the conversation with were very, very different. So um, South Africa and Ghana will go to a conference, and we are thought of as two forefront um, African jurisdictions that are participating in the international or the multilateral conversation. But I may have been the delegate. My, the delegate from South Africa is coming from a team where they have had you know, a lot more preparation and a lot more capacity building because they have a lot more experience. But we will be treated the same. And, and, and in the end, that was not the case. So you find that you are trying to participate, you have a seat at the table, but you can't fully indulge in the meal because you are coming with baggage that has not been addressed. And I think it goes to the root of um, Annette. Again, I'm going to refer a lot to your, 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 your contribution, the root of Annette's contribution, which is the fact that we have to use that, stop using that as a crutch as well because it gets to a point that you can't keep saying the same thing. Oh, we lack capacity, we lack capacity, we lack capacity. What are we doing about it now? And I think that um, we are seeing that growth and that development and that um, um, when I first started international taxation, it's not, this is not what it looked like. And it's very, very different. And it gives you hope because now Africa is being less reactive. Ghana is being less reactive. Initially, when you go and you have a conversation with the politicians or with the higher-ups about international conversations and, and policies and agreements, you, you had a lot of pushback and a lot of, we have bigger problems than this, you know, we can't feed our population, you're talking about BEPS, I mean. And, but now the import is becoming more relevant and a lot of that is attributable to the work of regional bodies such as ASAF, who have, you know, pushed the conversation. A lot of that is attributable to the work of CSOs who have made strides um, and, 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 and put us where we are now. But I think that it's important that one, we look at the fact that Africa, as we go and we try to work as a block, we are receptive of the unique challenges of the different jurisdictions. That is a key lesson that we must focus on. Um, another challenge that I, I think was, is very relevant to um, the African perspective is the dichotomy between the political will and the technical expertise. So you find that in a lot of African jurisdiction, technical expertise resides within the administrative people and the technical people. And you go a little bit up and there's a serious separation between um, the, the, the political bodies and, and the technical people. And that affects how we approach the negotiation table, how we approach discussions. Because you can go as a technical person to an international conference and, 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 and you've done the work, you've, you've read the documents, you've made positions, you've argued a point, and you go back home and find that something totally different has been agreed on the political level with no input from the technical part. And these are challenges that may be unique to the African experience or even to some African experiences. 
So um, as we talk about the changes and the growth and the development, we also need to know that because of all these unique challenges, we need to approach how we go forward differently. We need to have different priorities, and, we need, and that is why we need a, a unique space so that we can focus on some of these priorities and some of these challenges and some of these growths. But again, where we are now is hopeful because now um, conversations are being had about those unique challenges. Um, um, I know for a fact that ATAF in a lot of the work have addressed the fact that there's a dichotomy between politi political will and technical expertise. And that may not have come up in other forums because it would not be relevant in other forums. So that, those are the kind of lessons that I feel that as a jurisdiction, as a, a region, we have focused on. And that is why it is important that we continue to build our own table and prepare our own meals so that we, we are able to focus on some of these aspects and have um, a more robust contribution when we do come together as a block. Um, I, I, I'm going to be very short in my submission because I feel like everything else has been said, but I'm happy to contribute that and thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. This was such an interesting discussion already. Um, I think I'm going to uh, give Mary a chance to maybe comment on some of these things we have heard. And if you don't mind, Mary, I'm going to uh, throw a couple of thoughts in the mix uh, as well. They're very brief. One is, um, I found it really interesting what you said, Nan, about, of course, uh, Africa being a very heterogeneous uh, continent and group of countries in itself, which is obviously true. But also, how do we balance that against what uh, Mary said before? I think your fourth point was about having common positions and that collective voice. So is there a tension there, and how uh, can maybe ATAF help navigating it? So that's one. The other one uh, was about this distinction that is sometimes there between tax administration and tax policy. Um, and to use Annette's uh, words, it is one of the other one of the ways in which this mentality in silos sometimes comes up and uh, in and, and becomes very unhelpful in many ways. Um, but it is there, and uh, for you, Mary, I was wondering if you can maybe comment a little bit about um, ATAF's role, because obviously ATAF is a forum of tax administrators. Uh, so, to which extent are you engaging uh, with the policymakers as well, and uh, um, and if you can maybe reflect a little bit on the interaction between those multinational, uh, multilateral negotiations and the national um, domestic administration. I'm going to pass it over to you for a few minutes and I'm going to encourage everyone to please think about questions because the next uh, part will be to open up the floor um, and hear your comments and questions for the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Julia. And um, it was great you know, hearing what the three ladies have said. Don't you just love this panel? <laughs> Uh, with regard to the unique positions, Nana is very right. And we recognize this very, very early in the discussions because we go to a point where countries, I mean, it's not a secret, where countries like South Africa and Nigeria had interests that were slightly different from the others because there are different levels of economic development. And what we did is what I said earlier. So we provided support that was relevant to South Africa and Nigeria. So when we were discussing this, we said, okay, in your category and in your perspective, this is what you should be looking at. And then for the rest that were really uh, struggling, we also provided them with requisite uh, uh, advice. But what I want to say here is that that is definitely there. There's no tension at all, but we recognize that diversity. But what we want to say is, like Nana said, when we and we're all lumped together, then how do we fight together? For some of the things that are the common denominators, that is what I'm talking about. And that is what we've been working with at the level of the African Union to say, if we are not getting heard. For instance, let me talk about the pace and let me talk about the complexities because those cut across. Everybody said, no, hang on a minute. You cannot go for a discussion, receive documents, at one in the morning because the normal person will be sleeping at that time. And then you're expected to participate in a discussion that is technical the following day at 11 o'clock and then go on. So it was complex So for some of those issues. So there were those technical issues that needed to look at the economy, but there were those that were common, that were procedural, that also needed to be addressed and that could be easily addressed. In terms of the policy, yes, 
ETAF has been largely involved in administration, but as we went along, it was very clear that there's no tax administration without tax policy. And we have quickly come to the party, and we have come up with a full-fledged full, a full policy unit that handles these issues, and that is the unit that engages the African Union. And when we talk about the subcommittee, incidentally, that uh, Chennai talked about, that looks at um, the ta tax and illicit financial flows, by the way, in all the work that we do, the strategies that we have on IFFs is a replica of the, of the recommendations in the high-level panel. They provide that guidance, and that is what we follow to fight that. So what we have done is we have completely gone into the policy space. And even the subcommittee actually came up as an idea of ATAF. We pushed, we'd been having high-level tax policy dialogues, and it's, and I think Nana did participate in quite a number of those. But that now has become the subcommittee. What it means is that it feeds into the STC that uh, Chennai talked about, and the subcommittee feeds into the heads of state summit meaning that African tax uh, discussions are now at that level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to open the floor for questions uh, and comments. Please raise your hand. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, my ICTV colleagues to uh, help with handing over microphones, because, of course, we need to make sure that people online hear us. Um, so I have uh, Doris and Irma um, and a question at the back. So if we can get microphones to them, we're going to get those three. Have I missed anyone? Uh, anyone I haven't mentioned yet? Okay, so the three at the back we're going to get uh, in the second round. Let's uh, uh, get Doris, Irma and uh, uh, the question over here in the middle of the room, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies, for very, very uh, brilliant presentations and discussions. Um, it's very good to hear where we have come from. Uh, my comments are really comments. Um, the first one is I won't belabor the point because I think you've already made it very clearly, the gap that we've seen, we've had hitherto between administration and policy than before because um, it, it, it has been missing and so I will not belabor that point. I would like to offer perhaps a suggestion that even though our voice has become louder and we seem to be asserting ourselves a little bit more, we are still largely driven by discussions on uh, global tax agenda, issues that are defined by other people. We are looking a lot at uh, issues to do with illicit financial flows, the high-level panel, uh, things to do with BEPS and all that. I would like to suggest that perhaps as we go forward into the next decade, we need to also be more eminent on building issues relating to building tax capacity in African countries, because this has a direct bearing or feeds into financing for sustainable development. I know these other issues are important because they stem the leakage of tax revenues, but we also need to focus and, and, and try to prioritize areas that improve or strengthen the tax capacity of countries to mobilize domestic revenue, focusing on co-tax processes and helping tax administrations or making tax strategies that will help countries actually mobilize revenue at the domestic level better, even as we try to stem the leakage. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to please introduce yourselves for the audience online as well as those in the room. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So, Irma Mosquera, Leiden University. Um, I have two questions, actually three, but very short, two to Mary and one to Annette. So, the one that is very quick is to Annette. You have been working the UN FATI panel, and you have also already done a lot of work on the, there. And my question to you is, what do you see your contribution working on the UN FATI panel to the UN discussions at this moment? That's the first part. And two questions for Mary, very quickly. And it's kind of a challenge in the sense that I want to see what has been the role from ATAF since October, the outcome of statement, the political statement, and then we have these model rules, and then we have this administrative guidance. So my question is, what has been this 
what has changed, what has ATAF has done. And the second um, question relates more towards how do you see that in Africa, and how do you see that we can engage this, because I know that the African Union is very active and working with ATAF and so forth, but how we can see that in Africa we do have this real political commitment at all levels with all policy makers, so tax trade investment, what I have mentioned since yesterday, that we do have this connection. And also, if you see your role, for instance, of ATAF, of African countries, in the AU platform for tax good governance, where they also discuss about the list of non-cooperative jurisdictions, and they also discuss what tax governance is there. So, some challenges. Yes, and the question in the middle of the room there, um, we're then going to get to the three questions at the back and also here at the front. So just hold on for a second. Hi, thanks, uh, Miranda Stewart. So I guess a couple of remarks I would be interested in any reactions on the panel. Um, in terms of deepening the, the agreement-making work in ATAF and the Africa Union across countries on particular issues, it's interesting to remember that in, it looked like BEPS actions 1 to 15 came out of nowhere, but of course they didn't. They came out of decades of work inside working parties in the OECD, right? The, these, are, these were not, not developed in a year or two. Most of those actions were built on you know, decades of previous uh, reports and so on. And so this idea of building capacity might involve making decisions about ATAF and AU prioritizing some particular issues and then establishing working parties or some sort of committee structure where you bring countries together to do de detailed technical work that just builds the, builds the knowledge. Uh, so that you can then, you are then ready to engage in a hurry when something comes up. So just about that sort of process and if you had any thoughts on that. The other question is about domestic politics. It's, a, it's really interesting to hear about the engagement of ATAF and AU and the difficulty sometimes of connecting with the domestic political process and political leaders inside African countries. Um, it will depend on the issue, but I guess one thing might be country by country, are there ways when you can get quite easy buy-in from multiple actors? For example, in Australia, it would seem that the one thing both parties on both sides of politics can agree on is taxing multinationals. Uh, they seem to agree on this, even if they disagree on everything else. And so perhaps there is a way of building domestic coalition agreement within governments, within, within countries, on some issues and leaving aside the, the more difficult issues where you have internal disagreement. Thank Thank you very much. I'm going to pause a second and give a chance to the panel to uh, get back uh, on those uh, issues before we have another round, because this, uh, uh, this was already a very dense, dense round. Um, please, in whatever order you, you prefer. Uh, I will thank you, Ama. You asked quite a difficult question. Uh, she asked, uh, after my engagement with the UN FACET panel, what, are my, what could be my contributions to the UN discussions? Well, I'm an academic and a researcher at heart, <clears throat> and my role actually is to be a voice and uh, contribute to the discourse and contribute to the body of knowledge in Africa. And I think I've done my beat on that, and I'll continue doing that. I'm available for any engagement with the UN on this matter. Uh, you will have noticed that the UN FACET panel did actually recommend the UN Convention and the UN Tax Body. And after that, there was commissioned research again from the UN by myself on a report on asset recovery where we had to engage with the UN institutions and find out exactly how we can work on asset recovery and the return of the same to Africa. So there is continuing engagement. The good thing is that I have an independent mind, so I can say whatever I have to say without having to be um, worried about various implications. But that is it. That's the joy of being an academic, the joy of being a researcher, to bring out impactful research. You'd be pleased to know 
of the book, I think it should be the only book, I think, in Africa, on BEPS in Africa, a blueprint of implementing BEPS measures. That would be a good read. It literally looks at all BEPS action plans from an African perspective and looks at the policy implications and various administrative and economic policy decisions that African countries could take. That could be another way also of seeing how we can influence work on the continent. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um what Annette didn't tell you, Ilma, is that she also chairs the um, African Tax Research Network. So she's actually, uh, you know, very strong uh, in thought leadership. So I think you are modest, so let me do it for you. And so what I wanted to say um, in response to, I think what uh, Doris said were largely comments, and uh, Doris indeed the capacity in terms of domestic, uh, um, building domestic capacity is what ATAF you know, strives to do every day together with our partners in the different areas. And you're right, it's an area that we have to focus on. And uh, right now, um, when I gave the other example about Dev Hartnett, what we also realized is that I think Africa has spent so much of its time in addressing international tax issues that we are neglecting the other areas. And so that is part of what the subcommittee on tax and IFFs is trying to, you know, to encourage everybody to do, and that's what ATAF, you know, does. Because ATAF actually provides technical support to the African Union Commission, and uh, I'm sure you saw uh, that we even signed the MOU last week, so that we can continue doing this. In terms of the issues that were raised by Professor Ilma, uh, October and the decisions. First of all, when the decisions happened, we quickly sat down to say. How do we categorize the countries on the continent? The, those countries of the um, 140, I think, or 41 members of the inclusive framework, 27 of those are African. And there's a question that is often asked, but why is ATAF so involved in the work uh, you know, at the OECD? And the simple answer is that 50% of Africa is involved in the inclusive framework are members of the inclusive framework, and they are expected to follow what they signed up for. So what we did quickly was to segment the different members, those who had signed, those who had not signed, and those who are not members of the inclusive framework, and how they would be affected. And so from there, we then decided uh, to support them differently. But what was important is that we looked at the technical design phase, and we concentrated on the technical design phase the working parties, the TFDE, the steering group of the inclusive framework. ATAF acts as a, an observer. And as some of my friends know, at some of the meetings, uh, some of the closer friends have come to me and say, Mary, just to remind you that you're an observer because you've raised your flag three times. <laughs> and so, and to Lani in the technical meetings, and uh, Anthony and uh, the others, because you know, we, even in the observer role, we have tried, and I'm sure Rasmi will attest to this because <laughs> he knows he's always with ATAP. I wanted to say also that, uh, the, we, we, so during the technical design, we, are, we were involved and we are still involved in some of the remaining uh, elements of Pillar 1 as well as on the, you know, on the SCTR. So the technical design, we go in, we provide the technical. First of all, we unpack for the members the, the complex issues and then we provide them with what we feel would be best and fit for purpose in Africa. And then, of course, we are looking at implementation because Pillar, Pillar 2 is now a reality, and Pillar 2 comes into force in January. So what we are doing is preparing the countries to say, you have signed up, this is what you will need to do in the meantime. And then, in terms of tax governance at the OAU, this is really big, and Chennai, I'm sure, will also want to talk about this because last week, that was all everybody was talking about. Everybody needs to get their taxation right because that is the only sustainable way that Africa's Agenda 2063 is going to be uh, uh, attained. How is that going to happen? It is through, you know, um, using the available facilities like what ATAF is providing uh, together with our different partners on the, you know, on the globe and also making sure that at the political level we are engaged with emerging tax trends. That is my response to you, Irma. Thank you. Oh, sorry, there's somebody who asked about the committees. And uh, for the committees, or rather for um, 
how we are trying to address these issues. And you're right, I think the BEPS project came up because there were issues that had been identified and there were um, work streams that were put in place to address this. On the continent, we too are trying to do that. ATAP has uh, three committees to learn you or four? Four, thank you. So there's one on the cross-border taxation and that's the one that has been dealing with all these issues. Uh, as, uh, as the name suggests, there's one on value added tax and there's one on uh, exchange of information and domestic taxes. So what we have done is that we have converged these into what, uh, we have collapsed these into what we call the joint technical committee that addresses illicit financial flows guided by the high level panel and, and, and the fact findings. And then these feed into the African Union subcommittee right up to the highest level. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to you tonight then for, for the next response. Okay. Uh, no, thanks. I, th I think a lot of it's been responded to earlier. I think I just wanted to make a quick comment, um, I think, to some of the questions that Miranda had posed. So I think it's, it's absolutely true that when you look at the BIPS project and the work under that, that's been decades and decades of work that's led to, to, to where it is now. Um, I think at, at present, the conversation isn't necessarily that we need to start from scratch to do the same. And I think that that was what you mentioned in yesterday's panel, right? So now there's a conversation about there's work that's been done. How can we also ensure that there's certain processes that ensure that work that continues is inclusive, um, is cognizant of the different interests, needs of, of a wider base, right? Rather than those countries that were um, participating in conversations when the initial discussions around what are central tax topics um, when that began. So, so I think for me, as we're thinking about this UN tax body, this UN tax convention, it's not, it's not to say that we get rid of and start anew, right? I think it's really to see how can we start to make the tax system just more inclusive, so to speak. Um, and I think also to say, whilst, whilst we are celebrating um, I think as, 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 as Africans, what's happened in New York, it really is the beginning of, of quite a long process, right? Um, we're not going to see anything established next year, right? I think there's a whole host of series, meetings, resources, etc., that need to capacitate whatever it is that we're going to see at the end. I think right now it's been alluded to in the resolution as some sort of instrument or framework, so we still don't quite know what it's going to look like, um, but at least you know it, it, it's going in the right direction, and I think we are starting to see a reform, at the very least, of the system as a whole. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add that, um, again, in, in response to Miranda's topic, um, 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 comment about the amount of time it took to build that capacity and, and come out with what we now all see and going back to inclusivity and the, or the illusion thereof, that it's not enough to invite people to a table when everything has already been cooked over time. You have to acknowledge the fact that the time that it took to get to where you are and see how can you actually make it inclusive by factoring in all that they've missed. Um, 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 and, and that's something that as, 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 a, as Africa, we need to figure out how do we catch up because we don't have the time to build up that foundation. We, we, need to, we need to move on, um, but how do we move on, acknowledging what has happened over time and building on it when we don't have that same background? Um, I guess that's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I have three questions at the back of the room, so if you can raise your hands quite high so that uh, the mic can come to you, and uh, there is one here at the front as well. Um, if we have time, we're going to take more, but let's start with the back. And please, a reminder to introduce yourself. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you. I'm we cannot Aisha. hear you Can very you well. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so thank you for the comments I've heard so far. I'm Aisha from IBFD, the Center of Studies for African Taxation. And I have a few comments and a question also for the panel. So the first one would be, there's been a lot of discussion about the need for regional coordination in these discussions and harmonization of positions and policies that are African. And I would like to first of all question if we think 
what has been done by the AU or ATAF is sufficient and is the appropriate forum for this discussion. Because from most of the presentations, I see there's a discussion on political will and at some point there needs to be high level discussions on this. And I'm questioning if the forums we have have been able to capture and address that sufficiently. Second of all, we talk about capacity. And from the discussions, I also have seen that capacity is built as something afterwards. But then, um, ETAF has mentioned they have an observatory observing role in this discussion. So when it comes to votes, it's not necessarily the carrying vote. So what has been done to build capacity for jurisdictions or members to actually influence the policy at these discussions? And then, lastly, I would also like to ask about um, for participating countries, because we have been told some few countries participate in these discussions. What have they done to help in opening these discussions and also helping push other countries to be at par when it comes to um, building knowledge on subject matter? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, the next speakers to try to be as brief as possible so we can um, hear as many comments and questions as, as we can before five. Okay, um, I'm Cassandra Ravet. I study uh, transfer pricing governments, governance at the University of Antwerp. And I have a question on regionalism. So amidst all these uh, global efforts, uh, which I don't want to downplay at all, um, I am wondering what ATEF's ambition is to further invest or maybe facilitate regional alternatives to global norms that are, can maybe be um, uh, more politically feasible than unilateral measures, uh, given competitive um, dynamics and all. Um, so I'm very curious, especially in light of also capacity uh, constraints, what the ambition is on, uh, um, in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Elvis Chuata. I work for the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange on Information for Tax Purposes. Uh, two comments. Uh, my fear is that we are putting too much weight on this international debate about the UN resolution. It's not going to solve off our problems in Africa, at least in the area of tax. Why am I saying this? Having worked for 10 years with African countries, on something which we consider as the basic, exchange of information. Where is Africa on exchange of information? Whether you sign up to the pillar one, pillar two, to BEPS or no, you will need exchange of information. They are not doing it. Only for last year, the five African countries that are doing automatic exchange on financial account information, they received far more information that they sent. And this is in line with the report on the illicit financial flows from Africa. The African wealth is kept abroad, which means that it is of a huge concern for African tax administration to access the information on those data. We are not doing it. So this is my first comment. And the second one, and I will stop there, is we need to ensure sort of coherence between our international course and the way we prioritize our development on the continent. For example, we've realized that in Africa, we need capacity building, but we even need to do more to sustain the capacity of our tax administration. We need the political buy-in to support the work of the tax administration. One example, and I will pause here. Um, we've discussed with one African country saying, uh, you know, Cross-border recovery of tax claims is very important for us. But we see that developed countries uh, do not want to do. 
And my question was, okay, you've signed up to the multilateral convention on uh, mutual administrative assistance in tax matter. What is your position about the reservation? They had lodged a reservation to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there is one last question here uh, at the front, uh, and I have seen a few more hands, but I don't think we're going to have time for it because uh, I want to give still a minute uh, to all of our panelists to, to respond to at least some of the points. So over to you, and please uh, try to be as brief as you can. Absolutely. Thank you. I have a very, very brief question, and, and I'm Tatiana Falcon. Um, um, actually, it's a very nice question to have as a final question, I guess, but uh, you guys can decide the order which you want to, when you want to respond to. So if you had a vision of a fully inclusive intergovernmental organization that would work to further the interests of um, the African countries, uh, what would it look like? So it's kind of a provocative uh, qu question, and I think to, to break it down, I'd say um, if you had one element uh, that such an international organization would have to have in order to further the interests of African countries, what would be that one element that would be like a sine qua non element that you would want to have, want to see in there? Thank you. Thank you very much. That is indeed a very good question to, to, for a concluding round. And maybe, maybe adding on that, one of the themes that has been uh, coming out and that was mentioned also by Mary is about alliances. So what can your allies uh, do to make sure that vision uh, happens? I'm going to give you all one minute each. Unfortunately, we do not have much more than that, so you're going to need to pick. Well, Martin is giving us more time. He told me I had to be very strict, so he's enjoying this. <laughs> okay, so a couple of minutes each, uh, but uh, we do need to take uh, a bus in about half an hour, so I know that we cannot be too late. Yes, exactly. So, um, um, thank you. So I think uh, I'll speak to a couple of the questions. Um, th the first is that, um, so first of all, the, the focus of this particular panel was multilateral tax negotiations. <laughs> so so, so that, that was why there was a lot of emphasis on what's happening at the global level, right? And so this is not to say that there are still a lot of strides that we need to make at national level, right, with regards to tax administration, capacity, etc. cetera. Um, but but I think what we need to do at national level um, should also happen at the same time as reforms that we call for at the global level, right? So for example, when you take a look at the HLP report, it, it makes recognition of the fact that at national level there's certain, definitely certain changes we need to make, and it's very clear on that. But then it also says we should also be meaningfully participating in reform of the global tax system because if we're thinking through closing loopholes, we also need to participate in conversations about where those resources that are leaving the continent end up, right? And so they're, they're, they're not mutually exclusive conversations, right? And, and, and I think it's, it's important that we do have platforms like that, like this where we talk about international, but this is not to say that we, we don't talk about national level issues. So I, I think this is to the point, I think, that was made earlier about the fact that um, you know, yes, global tax, but we need to be talking about national level issues. I, I completely agree, I think, to, to that point. Um, I think I, I will probably just end with, I think there was just a comment around what does a fully inclusive space look like, right? Um, first of all, thank you for that question. Um, I, I think for us, you know, one of the things that the current resolution speaks to, well, two of the things, uh, just that idea of inclusivity, right? The current space, as has been mentioned over and over, has half of all African countries not participating, right? Some of them because they don't have capacity, some of them not that they don't want to, but you know, there's, there's, there's a number of different constraints. And so I think right now a space where at the very least all African countries have access to contribute, I think for me that would be very, very clear. Um, and then I think one of the other things that has been mentioned even since yesterday, right, is that when we are joining the inclusive framework, we have to accept everything that was agreed even before, right? And so I think essentially putting a place, a platform where there is room to have conversations, right, so that the existing, well not the existing, but essentially the rules that will then govern have input um, from all of country, all, all different countries, I think would be would be important because what we then end up having is certain rules that aren't necessarily um, specific or context context specific, right? And, and and in a sense, make it then very difficult to um, play them out. So I, I think those would be the two things that I would really like in an, an inclusive space. Thank you. 
So I'm just going to talk to the last points because I think a lot of the comments have been addressed. And um, I don't know if, the, if this is actually an answer to your, 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 your question, but there's something that I think um, it's very relevant and something that may not have been mentioned. I want there to be accountability. So a lot of the time, we talk a lot about all the challenges that Africa faces and the lessons that learned and, and, and the capacity that we lack and all of that. But one of the biggest things that I feel Africa runs away from quite a bit is accountability. So you get capacity building, you get training, you get this, and at the end of the day, what do you do on your end to ensure it gets done? I think one of the biggest challenges of implementing this dream and this vision of an, a multilateral level playing field is that when you are trying to, um, to address the lowest common denominator, you can get bogged down and achieve very little. If there is no accountability, if there's no pressure on everybody to do what they say they will do, when they say they will do it, how they said they will do it, if we've bent over backwards to make sure that everybody has a voice and everybody has a say, then everybody needs to do what they said they will do, when they said they will do it, how they said they will do it, get it done. So that's something I want to see. I'm not sure how that's going to be achieved, but it's, it, will be, it will be very interesting if it, I think it will be most effective if, it, if that is, a, is addressed. So thank you. Uh, thank you. I'll respond to the question on regional coordination and harmonization. This is very important for Africa. If we are going to speak as a united voice that can stand um, dialogue with the likes of China, with the likes of the U.S., we need to stand together as a body, if not as a whole African country, a continent, at least in bigger regional blocks. That is very important. Uh, why is this important? Um, because we already have the structures in place. But as to whether the structures are working, that's a different matter. We already have, for example, structures in the East African community, SADAC, COMESA, and now we, ha we hear that ATAF has uh, its own model, and the model is now going to be, that is for double tax treaties, that is going to be used um, uh, at the AU uh, uh, for all African countries. The challenge here is we have sovereign countries that have got the right to set their own tax policy. While that is going on, we also need to bear in mind that the race to the bottom does impact on the regional development uh, of all countries in the picture, and it impacts on investment that does come into the region at large. So if the whole region is developed, then everybody in the region gets to benefit from that. And the clout that regional coordination does bring in order when we have engagements among Latin negotiations is quite very important. We are pleased about the African Free Trade Agreement and uh, discussions are underway to make sure that that is materialized. Again, the whole thing about Africa is having systems in place, but getting them to get working is a very big problem. The delays, the political uh, red tape, corruption is a thing we need to address head on. I don't know, may God help us in that regard, but these are matters that we need to address as African countries, but regional integration and harmonization is one of the way I think we can make inroads and make our voice heard on the international scene. Thank you. I'll just respond to two uh, speakers, to what Aisha said, and then finally to what Elvis said. Uh, our, Aisha, you talked about the political will. Is that there? I think it is. I'm convinced that we are now in a space where the politicians understand that um, the only sustainable way to finance their own development is um, um, through the effective domestic revenue mobilization and specifically tax. And uh, that is, uh, of course, unfortunately, most countries had to learn the hard way uh, COVID, Russia, Ukraine, and how it affected safe food security in Africa, all that. Uh, and of course, most importantly, uh, the African Union Agenda 2063 and the SDGs all talk about uh, you know, domestic revenue mobilization as a key enabler to attaining those. You talked about what ATAF does in terms of providing uh, support to the members who are engaged in this process. 
Well, what we do uh, primarily is to brief the members about the issues. I talked about unpacking some of the complexities. We provide guiding notes, but we also organize debate, continental debate on, uh, on these issues so that by the time we go to the negotiating table, everybody is conversant with what they have to do. Elvis, um, I must say I don't share the same pessimism about the continent. I think if I see the work that, for instance, the Global Forum, where you belong, has done on the continent and in terms of exchange of information, I think what is very clear, a very positive outcome that has come out of all this is that countries realize that they depend on information and that information is power. And therefore, even as we go to the UN, some of these lessons are what we're going to take and what we will use to address some of the gaps that we've had before. In terms of the priorities and uh, how we do the capacity building and the pol political support that we need, as I said, and as Jerai said, last week we were at the, at the African Union Commission. It's a full-time agenda now to discuss tax. And so I'm very confident that as we go along, um, we continue to speak, we continue to have this, uh, this work, and even at the different regional levels, we continue to support each other and to work together to ensure that this happens. I saw in the room the Executive Secretary of WATAF, they are doing very excellent work, for instance, in West Africa, and because of this, the different regions are becoming more and more uh, able and more and more uh, concerned and engaged in terms of this uh, uh, tax policy. So thank you, Julia. Thank you everyone for your great insights. I know we didn't have time, unfortunately, um, to answer all of the questions. I didn't give you enough time, uh, but we must draw to a close. Um, and there are also some questions. I've seen your hands, I couldn't get to you. But we will have dinner, uh, and that's going to be the time when those who want to bring forward those conversations can do that, as well as uh, tomorrow, of course. On dinner, uh, I should uh, mention a logistic note, uh, which is that all buses will leave uh, the hotel at uh, 5.45. So uh, please be in the lobby on time, and I'm sure the team will direct you uh, to the right place. Um, that's all I need to say in lo on logistics. So uh, a final word to really thank you for sharing your insights uh, with us today. This was an incredibly interesting uh, conversation. I learned a lot, uh, and I'd like to thank you. Please join me in thanking the panel.